Welcome back to another episode of Camp Content. We are coming in hot per usual, but today it is extra exciting because I have one of my very good friends and uh, business peers and a person who I admire and love and hold dearly in my heart, but who is also really excellent at business and sales and business coaching. So I am super excited to have her on the show today. Uh, please welcome Katie Nelson. She is the CEO and founder of Sales Uprising. She is known as the Sales Catalyst because she is a badass. And she has been in business since 2006, coming up on an anniversary, or 2016 rather, coming up on an anniversary. Sales Uprising is a uh, a business coaching firm with a sales focus. So if you hate sales, then you should know Katie Nelson because she will teach you how to love sales and do it really well and crush those goals that you've set for yourself. So uh, if you have said to yourself or anybody else in the last year that I hate sales, this episode is for you 100%. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Ms. Nelson. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Ruland. I'm thrilled to be here. Hey. I welcome, know. welcome. Good to Thrilled see you. Thrilled that again. you are here. It is so exciting. Uh, you know, we would see each other a lot more often if we lived in the same country. But here we weird. are. That's so weird. <laughs> Although, you know, I feel like I get to see you a lot. I do the ethical Facebook stalking. That's right. You know, That's right. I WhatsApp you. We exactly. video. Who doesn't exactly. stalk Molly on Facebook? Because it's just pictures of cool trees in the beach. <laughs> Why Not wouldn't food. you do that? And an armadillo? Yeah. Wasn't it an armadillo? It was. It was. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't post pictures of me crying on the couch, so thank God for that, you know what I mean? No, I get to WhatsApp you for those things. Um, <laughs> exactly. Although I would say I also stalked you when it was pancake year. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm old school. Pancake gate. Pancake gate. Never forget. Every time I walk by a bag of Krusty's pancake mix at the store, I, I twitch a little bit. Uh, oh, God. No. No. <laughs> but, but anyway... <laughs> I like to show people my driver's license from North Carolina where I was like pancake face because I am so fat and round in those pictures. Well, more fat and round, but no. it is crazy. No. It is crazy. No. Pancake. Well, it was pandemic and pancake cake. I mean, we, we well, all, we all Look, packed We had on. to take our comfort where we could get it. Like, <laughs> let's right. be clear. And we all made <laughs> it through. So we're good. That's right. Winter was coming and it went. So here we are. But um, well, enough about pancakes. But yes, I'm I love hanging out with you and talking shop with you. And I love sales. You know, I was talking to somebody else the other day and they said, I hate sales. And I said, I love sales. I don't really like asking for money, right? Like there's a difference when you've done work and you're asking for the invoice and it's not being paid and you're being asked like that's very belittling. But sales is very empowering. And I think sometimes people confuse those two things. So I remember why I'm doing this podcast. Tell me more about your love of sales, Molly Ruler. I, I, I do. I, I can't get sales. enough of it, right? Was the person, <laughs> I have a question for you. Was the person who told you they hate sales a business owner? Kind of. She's an entrepreneur who really struggles, you know, and so, uh, cause she has a lot of blocks around money. You know, a lot of people, it's blocks around money is what it really is. Right. So uh, see, and here's the thing we can say that I may take exception to, I can't sell because I have blocks against monetary success sales before the money is a straight up relationship with yourself. Like if you're not firm in understanding who you are and what you can give to people, it starts there before it ever, ever gets to money. I agree. I mean, that's the thing. I, it's yeah, like, like that's, what Molly said, it's the difference well, ahead, of man. like, hey, here's the invoice, pay me for the work I did for you, where I guess if you want to dumb it down, sales is like, how can I help you do something cool? Because I know I'm good at it. And then you'll end up paying me for it. But it's going to help both go. of us. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to talk about like, there should never be an invoice that goes unpaid. All of that needs to be auto at this point. Exactly. Um, Hello, people. Your your CRM, depending on what you have, will even remind people when their credit card needs to be updated. Hello, I got 99 of those the other day because lo and behold, it's the month that my credit card needs to be renewed. But, right. um, you know, so we should never feel the icky part of like, hey, I'm chasing you for the cash you owe me for this amazing, awesome work that I just did for that, you. That I already did for you, right? That's yes, the... that should never be a thing. So right. first tip, everybody. Don't chase your people. Just put it up further in the process. Make it all auto. Be done with it. 
I so, agree. And that's exactly what I said to her, you know, because we were invoicing a client. I was like, I don't want to do 50 50. Let's just get paid up front. And she was like, Really? Yeah. And I was like, Yeah, <laughs> really. <laughs> but enough about that. Let's talk about sales uprising. You are killing it on the content side of things. Like, you are super busy. You are doing business retreats. You do like webinars or like, I don't know if you call them webinars, but online learning situations. You have a newsletter that goes out really consistently. Uh, you put out social media content consistently. You have a beautiful website, if I do say so myself. Uh, you know, so let's talk about that. Why, you know, uh, do you lean more on content marketing or do you guys do paid advertising or where do you fall in that, that mix? Thus far, I, th 2023 is the first year I've ever done like running ads on LinkedIn. I don't think we've ever, maybe there's been one on Facebook uh, over the course of seven years. Um, and let's be super clear. I think I told you that my content marketing mirrors that of the journey I take my clients on. In the first three years of this business, and you might have seen it, although I don't think you ever, ever did. And I wish I'd taken a picture of it because it's laughable now. But for the first two years of this business, I literally had one landing page. It was a landing page, people. And it was hideous. It looked like it was from, I don't know, I guess we could say the 2000s, although I wasn't really looking at a ton of websites then. Uh, and it just had who I was, what I did, the name of my company, and like my phone number that I still have. And it didn't require, in the beginning of my business, it wasn't so much about content marketing. In the beginning stages of my business, it was about going to get content for my content marketing. So I, I never... And it's what I teach our people. I, I never sat behind my computer and researched and created content about what I was going to teach people. All of that came super organically. So I think what you see now, which is, Katie, oh my gosh, you're blowing it up, which of course, you know me, I'll be like, he, oh my thanks, um, is really just because I've been in the game for seven years now. I have a bank of clients. I know what my people need. I am happy to give it to them. And we call them workshops, not webinars, because you're going to work. Man. I knew I was calling it the wrong thing. Yeah. And they're great. I went to one of them when I was still living in the United States, and it was really great. And there was a lot of people there, and there was a lot of note taking, and there was a lot of empowerment for the people that were in the room. So uh, if anybody checks out the sales uprising and content, you're thinking about attending a workshop, I highly suggest you do. In fact, I was thinking about taking one recently just because I get to hang out with you for a little while and I'd learn some stuff. Because I know that even if I took the same workshop from you, I'm sure it's evolved in two years or three years, right? Because the world has certainly changed. Well, it's evolved and or you've evolved, right? So sure. sales For is sure. like this lifetime journey. I've done it my whole life and I still have new things to learn about it and love about it and get into more. Um, so it's one of those things that it's not, it can be a set it and forget it kind of skill. Um, but if you do it right, it evolves with you. I love it. Well, I really love it. So tell me about how, how does, how does you get your clients typically? Is it, do you get clients from that content that you're putting out? Do you get like discovery calls and calls in from that, that content? Great question. Thanks for asking. Absolutely. We do quarterly workshops. Uh, it'll probably change for next year, but that's what they're scheduled for this year. I think you're going to be giving everybody the getting them to the yes, which is always a favorite, how to take, a prospect from the top of your pipeline all the way through to an, oh my God, I can't live without you scenario. Um, and that's August 22nd. And absolutely, we get discovery calls from that every single time. We, when I was younger in the business, I used to get clients. I used to just be like, all right, you guys, I poured everything into you. Do you feel like this is everything you need? And of course it's a, no, 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 I, this isn't everything. <laughs> um, and now we take people on a little bit of a slower journey. Which we're good. So with. kind of kind of building on that, you know, we were reading the thing earlier about, you know, you being in an AWBO, um, which we'll get to later. But at, towards the end of it, kind of building off what Molly said, it says it looks like something you say is like the sales conversation is about sharing your solution with somebody in a way that excites them, inspires them and makes them want to choose you. So kind of how are you taking that approach with each individual and different client? Um. Well, one, if you said, yes, I want to have a call with you, Katie, or yes, uh, Kelly Peck is my head coach. Yes, Kelly, I want to have mm -hmm. a call with you. We're going to just assume that you're excited about us because right. let's be clear, Matt, I'm a lot. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I'm okay with it. <laughs> right? right. And I'm right, not right. going to ever, you can go right. to my YouTube, you can go take a look at anything that I do. Mm -hmm. And I literally show up the same way everywhere right. I am. It's actually mm -hmm. super similar to Molly. And right. so if you see that and you say, you know, I really want to have a one to one conversation with you, the mm -hmm. assumption is, you don't think I'm right. going to be less than what I was when I delivered right. whatever it was I delivered and, to you. And then kind of to that point, though, you need to take that specific client and specifically curate it to help write their needs and the solution you can specifically give them to help them out. Uh, so you're kind of doing I a little bit of research on each or <laughs> no. just kind of, no, just no. heck it. You're just bringing um, the energy and just like, let's go. You're going to choose me. I know damn well you will. We're good. No. Well, no, <laughs> yes. let's have more of all of that. Let's have the ease yeah. of that. Uh, here, yeah, you now that. know me. Jump into my pocket. Like, jump mm. into my bank account. That's awesome. Um, although that has happened a couple times recently, which is really nice. Uh, but those are relationships I've had for years. So uh, what it, it isn't necessarily curating a solution. I'm a business coach specifically for business owners in a couple of different stages in their business, which is one of the things that allows for differences for sales uprising. We work with businesses that are looking to make their first quarter of a million dollars so that they can make their next quarter million dollars, right? The assumption for us, for our prospects and our clients is that you're in it to win it. You're, you own a business because you want to make money at it. And there's no judgment about that. As a matter of fact, we want that for you because small businesses fail when they don't make money. That's, it's literally the first goalpost you have to get to, to be able to pay your bills, to not go broke yourself and to literally make a living out of the thing that you love, which is what we all want to do at the end of the day. I haven't met an entrepreneur who's like, yeah, so I'm going to do this thing I super, super hate, but it's going to make me tons of money. So that's just not the vibe that I attract. I'm sure there's people mm. like that out there maybe. Um, Unf so unfortunately, from, yeah, right. there's a lot of that going around, right? In the, in the tech world, it's like, it doesn't really matter what the product is, right? The revenue is more important, but that's why we love you, Katie. Though. Oh, thanks, honey. Um, I've been selling my whole life and I've never been successful at selling something that's just a means to a monetary end. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't fill me. Um, from a curation perspective, at the end of the day, Matt, my clients all have the same problems and they can say that they don't. They can say, no, 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 my industry states that it should be like this, but they're not their industry. They're them in their business. They aren't industry yet. The goal is to go work with a coach. And maybe it's not me. Go work with a coach and then hope to become a part of your industry if that's so important to you. But at the end of the day, you're a solopreneur. Your bills look the same. How you run your marketing is the same. How you create people who know, like, and trust you is the same. My clients <laughs> all have the same problems. So the conversation and the curation is on their end, being able to identify whether or not I can support them. Hmm. I love it. So let's talk about NABO because I want to talk about NABO. Uh, NABO is the <laughs> National Association of Women Business Owners, uh, which I attended a few meetings of and met some amazing people. And uh, I, I I understand that you are now the head honcho over there. No, I'm just what no. Is, I know, I know. I'm just kidding. So what is your official, I just said that to make you embarrassed. So what is your uh, official title at NABO as of 23-24? Yes, July 1st, uh, at the end of June, I was installed on the board and I'm actually the chair of the sponsorship committee. So for um, any of your listeners whose like bag it is to support women business owners, there I'm happy go. to put your name in flashing lights in the greater DC metro area for NABO. So let's, let's tell us a little bit about NABO so people know what that is and, and how they, why they would want to sponsor things. Sure. I will tell you my own particular relationship with NABO, which has been off and on when I first started in business and you're um, looking for new clients. It was a place where I went to go network and thought I would, these are all potentially my clients, right? And so... The reason why I entered Dabra was to go get business. And then I had to out myself. I had to quit that membership because that didn't happen. And over the course of the three memberships that I've had in the past seven years, um, the reason why I went back is because that's no longer specifically what I look for in this particular arena. It's not a referral networking group, right? right. Um, what the National Association of Women Business Owners does for me is allow me to advocate for women business owners' rights. 
Yeah. Uh, and that would be, for example, at the beginning of June every year, nationally, we come together and we go walk the hill and we talk to our delegates about legislation, bipartisan le legislation that's specific to women business owners, which often get overlooked. That is so amazing. I love to hear that. And uh, what a what a great and honest distinction, you know, to to share with us that like, you know, you were looking for leads. And I, I mean, right, we're, we're all we're all doing that at some point, especially these networking, like the BNI, it gets a little murky, like, what do you, you know, uh, and Nabo is a very supportive environment. And you might find a lead there, right. But I think, you know, you know, it's not impossible. I mean, one of the things that uh, really blew me away when I went to a Nabo meeting is I walked up and it was at, you know, the Maggiano's and Tyson's Corner, right? And I Let's walked up. Let's be really quick. Molly was also speaking there. So just for anybody listening, this is actually the first time I met Molly. She was introduced to me by oh, that's maybe right. the then president or the immediate past president, Molly Gimmel, who is still a member of our chapter and we love her dearly. Um, and she gave this badass talk on guess what you guys podcasting yeah <laughs> imagine that imagine that that is right that is the first time i met you oh my god look at that thank you nabo we i just sent a thank you note to nabo for introducing me to katie nelson for real um but i walked up and there was a very nice lady standing there older lady probably in her 60s or something and she said oh it's so nice to meet you and she said who would you like to meet who would you like to be introduced to here how can we help you before i walked in the room and i just i've never like what a wow, you know what I mean? Like, wow. And I, so I gave her like a 10 second, well, this is what I do. And she said, I know exactly who you need to meet. And she <laughs> walked me into the room and introduced me to somebody. So I didn't feel alone or unsupported or awkward in this room. Uh, and so I, you know, go Nabo. I was, I was very impressed with, with that situation, but knowing that they're doing such important work too, I think is just a, uh, it's an important distinction, you know? It really is. And it's not the foot you lead with first, right? So Nabo is never going to say, hey, you're not going to get clients here. As a matter of fact, if we're honest, I have clients there now. And it's also so much more. So it took me years to really understand what I, as a member, uh, where <coughs> I could put my energies and my focus that was beneficial to me and my business. And I've found it on the advocacy side of the house. I love the education. There's the Nabo Institute. Uh, for anybody who's interested, they'll have their uh, Women Business Conference in Texas in October. Uh, I'm super looking forward to that. I think I'm, yeah. So it's amazing women who get to learn from amazing women, who get to support amazing women and the future of women business ownership, which, so just as a historical fact, and I told you and Matt this before, but it astounds me every single time I hear it, that it, it wasn't again. until, right? It wasn't until HR 5050 and that bipartisan piece of legislation that NABA was instrumental in moving forward that women could actually sign for their own businesses financially. 1988. I don't know about the demographics of the people who listen to this podcast, but I'm going to tell you every time I say 1988, it makes me die a little inside. That's just not far enough <laughs> ago. And I think that and not to get political, but if we take a look at the political climate today where it does not feel like rights are um, cherished the way that they used to be, um, my business is super important to me. The work that I do with my clients is super important to me. And the idea that all of that could be taken away in the blink of an eye, as with so many things lately, is not acceptable to me. Amen, sister. I mean, it, it, uh, <laughs> sorry, Whew. got myself a little hot there. Sorry. I don't know. I love it. Let's do this. I mean, it wasn't until the Equal Credit o Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974 that women were allowed to open a bank account. Yep. So it was only you know 14 years earlier that we were even allowed to have our own money. Yep. Just pause for the cause on that one. My <laughs> God, you know what I mean. It's crazy. And then now we're also having conversations, right, where you see people are talking about, like, if you want to end poverty, give women more empowerment, pay women more, they'll fix everything. Like, we're, it's starting to shift, which, you know, I guess if you look at it from that perspective, right, like, if the pendulum swing is can't even have her own money 35 years ago, you know, or no, wait. I'm, I'm 46. So it was, I'm or like, 47. That's so it was 46 years ago. I know, right? 
Right. 46 <laughs> years ago, we could open a bank account and then, you know, 30, uh, three years later, we could, you know, or 10 years after that, we could, or 33 years ago. Yes. Right. So, so, and now, you know, we've got a woman vice president, we have women business owners, we have women in the fortune 500. So, I mean, we, we still have a lot of ways to go, but I love that Nabo is focused on the important things mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I love being around women and there's a special kind of energy and fulfillment you get when you're like around women and you're empowered and you feel safe and you like you, your cup gets filled. But I think sometimes some organizations lean too much on just that part and not enough on like, but what are we really doing other than saying that you're enough? Like you're enough. Okay, cool. I'm enough. <laughs> Let's go write some legislature. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, and I, you know, so I think as with everything, um, the colors shine brightest when there's a full spectrum. So I think that there are places mm, for the I am enough institutions. Yes. And I think that as we grow through our colors, uh, we get to decide what am I going to do with my I am enough? If my anything. enoughness. Yeah. Yeah. What's next? What do we do now? Right. And there's so many. Mm, generational stories that haven't even gotten to a woman is enough yet that I think that if those women are lucky enough to get to the I am enough, it's okay. You can just be enough. We support that. We're about that. Enjoy that. hundred percent. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, but then we got to get past like, okay, now what do I do with the enoughness? Like you said, how do I make money? How do I raise money? How do I sell things? How do I run a business? How do I actually do this with my new found empowerment? Right. And even if you don't, even if you're just with your enoughness chilling and you feel better, that's great. But for the women that do want to do those things, I like that there's more resources, right? So it's no shade on me anybody too. who's not, but I just, I want to go a little further. Show me how to make the money. Show me the money. Show me how to make yes. money. You know? I have a whole wet workshop called show me the money. I know. Uh, I was plugging it for you, boo boo. Yeah. You're cute. Um, thanks, <laughs> Molly. Mm -hmm. um, show me the money. Show me the clients. Getting them to the yes. Knowing your numbers. Like yeah. not everything is about. Let's talk about business really quick. So yes. business in and of itself is not human. It's a human construct. It has no feelings. It does not care. It you know it has a great day every day. It's in and of right. It's not a human thing. <laughs> so if you're having a bad day as a business owner, that's you. The goal is to make it so that your business still survives, even though you've had a bad day. As entrepreneurs, we have this emotional up and down that we cannot, literally cannot afford, right? Mm -hmm. We need to stay even keel and on point and as with it as much as possible. I can go break down elsewhere. I tell my clients this all the time. <laughs> There's nothing like being an entrepreneur that requires more of you than every other institution in your life up to and including parenthood. And the example for that is you're in DC traffic. You are late to the dentist appointment. Johnny is kicking the back of your seat because the DVR broken it, that is now in the back <laughs> of the headrest is broken. And so he's losing his absolute shit, if I can say that. And you turn around and tell Johnny to shut the hell up. Try doing that to a client and see how far your business is going right. to go. <laughs> right. You know, even though we feel that way, we're like, back to the people who aren't paying us, even though we gave them great stuff, right? How frustrating can that be? Super frustrating. Do we want to allow it to knock us off our block in the continuance of our business? No. So sales is the first thing that taught me that sales is a heartbeat. First of all, you're going to find the best deal you've ever made in your whole life. So maybe it's your first deal. Maybe it's your 20th. You're going to feel so good about it. And the very next phone call has the ability to make you feel like crap. <laughs> make you want to jump out the window. You just right? opened. Like, make you quit yeah. your own business that you are poured your heart and soul into. Right. Um, a friend of mine and Molly's Sharon Washington will talk about how she's going to quit all the time. And it's a joke, right? Like, oh my God, today's the day I'm going to quit. Um, and we never do. So what you want is to just stay even keel, do the steps. The beautiful thing about sales is that it's a skill set. So once you truly decide to learn that skill set, just like math, two plus mm -hmm. two is four. The reason why you know that is because literally it was huh? repetition over and over oh, and over again. For sure. First grade, second grade, third grade, 12 times 12 is what, right? And it just kept growing from there. Sales is Ooh. very much like that. You totally. learn it once and then you continue to practice it and it just gets better and better. It's very and, unemotional. 
And if you, you know, and I think what it boils down to, and, and when you touched on it earlier, like I'm a great salesperson when I'm really excited about the thing. I'm not trying to sell it. I have, I have sold pro like, I was talking to somebody about magic erasers for 15 minutes the other day, like, cause I was like, no, you don't understand. They're amazing. Like if I'm truly excited about something and I know that it works and I know that it has value, I am going to like, want to share that with you. I don't work for magic eraser. I get nothing from that. I just know that she would really like to have one in her house. Right? So when you feel you know that way it? about your, what's that? It's a Both remarkable magic erasers. <laughs> no, but I use those to get the little things off my patent leather shoes. It's a remarkable, it's a remarkable too. I, so many people are like, are you an affiliate? That's what people think, right? Are you an affiliate? Do they pay you to talk this highly about stuff? No, I like no. it. It's beneficial to me. If it's beneficial to me and you're like, Hey, what's that? Go buy a box, go to Costco immediately. Talk to Bezos, whatever it is, go buy lots of magic erasers. Molly's right. They're like kind of the most amazing magic. thing ever. They're magic. They're appropriately named. And so, but it's like your business too. If you're, if you know that what you do is going to work and provide value, then it doesn't feel icky, right? Or mm -hmm. skeevy or salesy to talk about it. Cause I'm like, I know it works. I know it's going to work for you. I know there's value here. So I don't feel like it's a very different feeling than when I work for Toyota and they wanted me to sell the extended warranties. And I'm like, these are shit, you know, and I know they are. And I would tell the, I would tell the people, you can buy this and I'd go, don't do it. But, and it would hit my sales numbers, but like, I didn't want them to waste their money. Right. But when I'm excited about something, it doesn't matter if it's $20,000, if I know it has value and I know it's going to work and I know it would be good for you, then it's really easy for me to try to show you why. And so I think, and you know, every one of us should have that first and foremost about our own business, right? Exactly. To your point. So when we say, when we attribute words like icky, um, my least favorite word it, that doesn't even exist in the English language is salesy. That's actually salesy. not a word. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. These are all when we, um, what is it called? Anachronistic? What is it? Hmm. Mm, I'm going to forget it, but word. it's us attributing human feelings to a thing that is not human and has no human feelings. It's like when you tell you, when you think that the dogs look guilty, Molly, that that's not a real thing. <laughs> like that's us. Projecting I don't know. That you on should them? see Jojo's face sometimes. She's looking very I cool. I do. I see all the pictures of Jojo's face. I don't think <laughs> yeah. there's a single angle of Jojo's face I have not seen. Um, <laughs> Anthropomorphis anthropomorphism? Anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphize something like that. Yeah. Okay. There yes. we go. The brain's working a little bit today. Anthropomorphication. Uh, yes. Thank yeah. you, Matt. Um, and that's very specific with animals. But so that's what I mean by it all comes from us first. When people say sales is so icky, that's because they feel icky when they do what they think selling is. Well, exactly. You know, so I was just looking this up on online. I have a friend, um, Jade uh, Connolly Duggan. She's like, uh, she's a genius, honestly. And she posted the other day, she said, it will always baffle me when people complain about somebody's being somebody's emails being salesy. Like when was the last time Amazon wrote you a nurture love letter? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I was like, that, that, that's a, that's fair. You know what I mean? Like it, it, you know, like should it, is it less authentic to try to hide the fact that you're selling? So like, I don't like, what is the alternative there? Right? Like to not be salesy. It's like, well, I mean, I want my business to be successful. <laughs> Therefore, yeah. I want to sell you. Now, I only want to sell you if you're appropriate for what I do. I only want to sell you if you personally feel you will find value of, from this. Right. Like, there's, it's a sales. The beautiful part about sales is literally is that it, it isn't just me. And I say this, it's not about you, boo. It's about <laughs> them. Like, I only know what I can do. And I can be as honest about that. And I can tell you how much that's going to cost and what time it's going to take and how we're going to do that. If that's important to you, although let's be clear, it's not. So I can give you all of that. So what do you bring to the table? Right? Do you have a need for me? No. Okay. Decision tree right there. We can just go have coffee and our life can look different than, than <laughs> okay, this business yeah. scenario. Yeah, exactly. You know, show me your pictures of your dogs. <laughs> um, <laughs> If it. yes, there's a need, then let's get into it. Um, it is so wonderful because I, uh, you had talked earlier when you were introducing me about my love for sales, uh, Q1 of 2024, and I'll make sure that you guys stay 
abreast of the situation, I'll be putting out a book called Sales is a Love Language. And it's just how I feel. If I, it, it starts first with the belief in me and what I deliver and my intention. Nobody can tell me that. Everybody on earth can be like, oh my gosh, she's so this. And I'll still have buyers. Think about the slimiest person you know, the, 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 oh, the guy from the CarMax commercials or whatever that's always, right. you know, that guy. They still have clients. <laughs> well, customers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's people like who will still buy from them. So if you as, your entrepreneurial self who has amazing things to sell just puts it out there in the way that you would put it out there, whatever that looks like and feels like for you, your people, you'll find your people as long as you're consistent and you do the right steps and you learn the skill set of selling. I love it. I absolutely. Was it too much? Oh, sorry. Okay. No, oh, I love perfect. it. Perfect. No, it's it's amazing. It's me. You're amazing, Katie. I love hanging out with you. It makes me want to hire you to be my business coach. Honestly, I always, I'm always reminded of how awesome you are. Well, all right, then I'll make sure. What are you doing tomorrow? I'll call you at 10 a.m. We can discuss that. <laughs> you can let good. me know what you. Here's my right scheduling now. link. Yeah, think about it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, um, Ms. Nelson, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. We, uh, you know, it's always nice hanging out with you, but I love learning mm -hmm. more about sales uprising and Nabo and all of the things. And I'm sure some of our listeners, uh, love your energy and vibe as well. And I hope you will, uh, they will hear from you. In fact, you have a CTA for today, Matt, do you have that handy? I closed it out actually. Or, uh, or Katie, you can deliver yeah. it if you want. Yep. It's a very specific thing for your next workshop mm -hmm. on in August on the 22nd called. Getting them to the yes is what it's yep. called. And it Getting literally your prospects is about. to yes faster in your sales pipeline. Gang, 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 gang. So right? we will make sure As to put the link for that in the show notes so people can sign up and get on board with that mm -hmm. program. Please do. Please, please do. That it would is be amazing. An event that is built for entrepreneurs like you in mind, those filled with passion, but uncertain how to get their foothold in the market with potential prospects. Right. So for, so basically what Matt just said, you guys, is for all those people who've made all these amazing connections and they're literally hanging out in the ether and you're like, so what do I do with them now? I've had amazing conversations with them. You've already done the thing where you made this great connection. They were totally into what you did and you just waited for them to say yes to you, even though you never made an offer. I'm amazing. Just say yes to me. Oh, you want to know how to pay me? I know I haven't told you that yet. So it's about pulling them through your pipeline. You, you do not want a stagnant pipeline. You want to keep it moving, people. Keep it moving. Like fresh. I love like it. That. I love it. Well, on that note, people, check the link. Join the workshop August 22nd. It's going to be a good one. You might even see me there because it's never you can never learn too much, honestly. And that's what I feel like you should constantly sharpen your sword and get better at things. And let's face it, it's been a hard couple of years, a lot of transitions in people's businesses, a lot of stuff personally for a lot of people. Maybe you don't have your juju like you used to. Maybe you feel a little off in your game. Well, go, go to Katie's workshop and freshen up your skills and sharpen your sword and go back out there with like a renewed sense of uh, excitement about your offers and your, your services and go crush some sales goals for the last quarter of the year. That sounds like a great way to spend uh, August 22nd morning or afternoon because what else are you doing in August? If you live in DC, you're inside. Okay, you're inside. I know you are. So on that note, thank you all for tuning into Camp Content. Uh, we appreciate all of our listeners. And if you could leave us a review on iTunes or whatever, anywhere you want, really. But mostly if you could share this content on LinkedIn, if you found it valuable. And don't forget to tag Katie and tell your friends about her workshop on August 22nd. And until next time, be excellent to each other. Thank you. Produced by HeartCast Media.